Well, my introduction is the same as normal. We, if you're a Christian, you're in 1994, and God's called you to be a Christian at this hour. We thank God for all the men and women who've given us such a wonderful example in the past. They were called to be Christians then. We're called to learn from their example so we can be Christians now. But there are issues that we've got to face, and there's a great deal of unclear thinking. We do need to be clear. I'm speaking to you tonight about abortion. Abortion is killing. Abortion is the killing of the unborn. Those unborn are boys or girls. Abortion is the killing of unborn boys and girls. That's the subject. It's a very solemn and sad subject that I have to speak to you about tonight. If you've been looking at the sheet before the service began, or in, since, you'll see that I've asked you to answer three questions. Can you answer these three questions? In the United Kingdom, how widespread is abortion? Every Christian weeps when we hear of 66 people killed in Sarajevo. On the same day, in the United Kingdom alone, 500 boys and girls were killed by abortion. I'm speaking to you tonight, I'll speak to you for about 30 minutes. In those 30 minutes, 10 boys and girls, unborn, in Britain, will die by abortion. Every three minutes, there is an abortion in our country. That's how widespread abortion is, and that's what I'm talking to you about tonight. Could you answer the second question? Why have Christians passively accepted this situation? In other words, why have they, on the whole, there are some wonderful exceptions, why have they sat down, looked at their TVs, expressed disgust, but done nothing? The answer to that is through ignorance. By and large, Christians in our country are ignorant of three things. They are ignorant that it is babies that are being killed. They are ignorant on how those babies are killed. And they are ignorant about what the Bible says on the subject. And let's take those three points. Most abortions, ladies and gentlemen, take place when the unborn child has been conceived nine weeks or up to 12 weeks. Most abortions are in the nine to 12 week bracket. Remember those words, nine to 12 weeks, and perhaps the reality will come home to you. The moment this baby is conceived, he, she, begins to develop. Every cell has its own genetic code. It's the same genetic code running through every cell. And so, already decided are the color of the eyes, the color of the hair, whether it's a boy or a girl, whether he will be big and strong or thin and slender. Here is a unique individual coming to birth. That genetic code is not the same as his or her's mother's. Whether it's her appendix or her ear or her foot, every cell in her body has its genetic code and every cell in his developing body has its genetic code and it is different. We have a unique individual coming to birth. After 22 days, Remember, I told you about nine to twelve weeks. After three weeks and a day, his heart begins to beat. He has his own blood group. He has his own circulation. After 25 days, he's an eighth of an inch long. But the eyes are beginning to form, the nerve system, the lungs, the stomach, the kidneys, and the liver, 25 days. 
After six weeks, the brain is beginning to work. And with the instruments that we have in 1994, brain waves can be picked up six weeks from conception. The fingers are beginning to form, and so are the toes. And the future pattern of the bones is now complete. They're in cartilage form, but the future pattern is there. And many doctors now believe, and there's a good deal of evidence, that even at six weeks, he can feel and therefore respond to pain. Six weeks. By the eighth week, baby is, for all intents and purposes, complete. His limbs, his arms and legs begin to move spontaneously and he responds to touch. Eight weeks. Yet most abortions take place between the ninth and the twelfth. By the end of the fourth month, he sleeps, he wakes, he responds to sound, and he responds to light. And after that, he grows and grows just the same way that he or she will grow after birth. Most Christians are ignorant that it is a baby being killed. Most Christians are ignorant of how it's done. Now, fortunately, you do have a squeamish pastor. I'm not proud of that, it's just a fact. I'm not going to describe to you in detail how abortions are done. But I am going to tell the boys and girls and men and women here tonight that most babies in Britain, over 300 a day, are sucked out of their mother's womb in pieces and put in a pot. I'm going to tell you that many others, the tiny ones, are cut to pieces with a special instrument. And that those who are a bit bigger, they are salted out. It's a saline abortion. There is, as you know, a sack of fluid around the baby, and after 16 weeks, there's sufficient fluid there, and salt is injected in very high quantities into it. Baby's skin is literally burnt off, and a, year late, a day later, normally mother gives birth to a, a dead, shriveled baby. If baby's very large, there will be a caesarean section, but they don't call it that now. Of course, they call it a hysterotomy, and it's in, I, virtually identical to a caesarean section, but the baby is born and left to die. Most believers do not know what is happening in our country. They are ignorant that it is babies and they are ignorant of how it's done. They are ignorant of the scandal which we have to live amongst. And they are ignorant of what the Bible teaches on the subject, which will be what we'll deal with in a moment. So could you answer that second question? And can you answer the third one on the sheet? What ideas have led to abortion becoming socially acceptable. Ancient Greece had abortion, but ancient Britain in the last few hundred years didn't. How is it that in the lifetime of so many of us, abortion, which was regarded as outrageous and unthinkable, has now become socially acceptable and widespread? How is it that what ideas have led to this terrible situation because, friends, things change when ideas change. The battle is always for the mind. There are two ideas. There are two ideas which have become fixed, lodged in people's minds. Here is the first. A woman has a right to do what she likes with her own body. But if you think it through, that idea cannot possibly be correct. First of all, nobody has a right to do what they like with their own body. Because who gave you your body? Did you give it to yourself? It's God's gift to you. We shall be judged, says the Bible, for what we have done in the body. 
you are responsible to your creator for your use of the body. But think it through even as a non-Christian, if you're a non-Christian. Is this baby just an extension of the mother, like a fingernail to be cut? Is it? No, it is a developing human life with its own genetic code, its own unique genetic code. And as I've just explained, characteristics which are distinctive of him or her alone. We are talking about a human life. Some people accept that, but the second idea which is lodged in people's minds still lets them permit abortion. There is the idea even amongst many in this church that there is such a thing as a human life which is not worthy to be lived. And that idea has become to imp impregnate our thinking. It's there in our papers, it's thrown at us through the television, and it's become, it's getting stuck onto us. There is such a thing as a human life not worthy to be lived. The teaching of the word of God is, it's sufficient to be human, to have a right to live, unless of course you take another life. The modern teaching is that it's not sufficient just to be human, you've got to have some other qualification. And therefore if you are human, but you're badly deformed, then perhaps you don't have a right to live. Being human isn't enough. So it, there is such a thing as a human life which is not worthy to be lived. If you're a human, not born yet, but your spina bifida, perhaps you don't have a right to live. Perhaps your life isn't worth living and perhaps you shouldn't be allowed to live. And so the thinking goes on. That is the situation in which we find ourselves in 1994. Now be careful which Christian bookshops you go to. After a message like this, some of you will say, yes, I ought to know more about abortion, and so you should. You'll go into a Christian bookshop and you'll look for books on abortion. And you will find in Christian bookshops books which tolerate and in some cases even commend the practice which I'm speaking about. I'm not allowed to do commercials in messages. We don't have books like that in Egbeth Christian Bookshop. <laughs> be careful what you read and be careful to understand that the Bible is clear on this subject. If you've noticed, the subjects which I'm speaking about on Sunday nights are all violations of the Ten Commandments. This one is two. You shall do no murder, says the Word of God. Let's show, let me show you from the Bible some things to know. Please have your Bible open. We shan't look at all the texts, but we shall look at some of them. There are two points to grasp. God's word, which we have now open, teaches that the unborn child is a person in the full sense. Now I want to discourage you as Christians from using the word fetus. It's an English word, it's a correct word, and it's not wrong to use it, so it's not a sin. But I would like to discourage you. People often think that by changing the name, you change the reality. The use of the word fetus so widely, which before was just a technical term, is deliberate. It is to give you the impression that the unborn child is less than human. It's to try and get you to talk about the abortion debate by talking about something which is not human. And once you can relegate the unborn child to the area where it's not fully a person, then of course you can start justifying abortion. The unborn child is a person in the full sense. Not fully developed, not fully grown, incredibly dependent. 
but a person. Turn to Genesis 16:11. Who is speaking? The angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? Those of you who studied this passage in particular and that subject will know that the angel of the Lord here is the Lord Jesus Christ in a theophany. He hasn't yet come in flesh, but he's appeared in a visible form. Who is the speaker then here? It is Christ. Who is he speaking to? Hagar, who will bear shortly Ishmael. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, describing Hagar's pregnancy. Behold, you are with child. Isn't that interesting? That's exactly what the Hebrew says, except the Hebrew doesn't have the word are, because the verb to be is often left out in Hebrew. You, with child, is what the Son of God says to Hagar. The Son of God is recognizing that what is in Hagar's womb is a child. Not a, it is a child. That's what we're talking about. Now turn to Exodus, the next book in the Bible, chapter 21. This amazing verse, well, so I say amazingly, this verse has been used by people who believe in abortion to justify abortion. Exodus 21, verse 22. If men fight, and the word in the original language can mean wrestle or struggle. So I want you to imagine two fully grown men who are having a fight and they're throwing each other to the ground and other people are getting involved or bumped into or banged. If men fight and hurt a woman with child, that's what the Hebrew says, that's what it says in this Bible too, so that she gives birth prematurely, and if you're using the New King James Version with a margin, you'll see that there's a little number there. Look in the margin and see what it says. And it says this, literally. Her children come out. Now let's read the verse again. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that her children come out, there it is, twice. She is bearing in her womb children. That child which has come out prematurely is a child. Yet no lasting harm follows. He shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Have you got this, the scene? These two men are fighting. They bump into a pregnant woman. She gives birth prematurely, but the baby is unharmed. They have to pay a fine. But what happens if the child is harmed? Verse 23. But if any lasting harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Life for life. Capital punishment for deliberate murder. Capital punishment for injuring a woman whose baby comes out and dies as a result of that injury. Could there be any stronger recognition in the word of God that that is a human life and that what you have done is so awful and so heinous that all you can do is forfeit your own. Look at Psalm 139. Here is David reflecting upon the fact that God knew him as David. That God knew him before he was born because God made him. And that he was already a unique human being. 
before he was born. Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verse 13. For you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. And he talks about how he's skillfully woven together. Me, David, a unique human being, and you knew me, and you did it. And the uniqueness of his identity is recognized in his unborn condition. We will go to Matthew 1, chapter 1, to show you beyond any doubt. If you believe anything at all about the Bible, these verses will settle your doubt forever. That a baby is a baby from the moment of conception. Genetics shows that, but the Bible teaches it. Matthew 1.18 Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of, Mary, of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, at what point did the eternal Son of God, who continued to be God, take on himself our human nature? When did the Son of God, at what point did the Son of God become man? At what point were these two natures wonderfully joined together, two distinct natures in one person? At what point did the miracle take place? Because if you can answer that, you can answer when human life begins. Was it just that there was a baby in Mary's womb, and then the eternal Son of God, as it were, sort of adopted it and entered into an existing baby? No, it wasn't. That baby was in Mary's womb because he was conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. And it was when the Holy Spirit, by that amazing miracle, conceived Christ in Mary's womb. It was at that moment that the wonderful, wonderful union of two distinct natures took place. And he became that holy thing, shrouded and protected by the Holy Spirit. There was no Joseph involved, no man involved. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so there was a, the incarnation. The eternal Son of God took upon himself flesh. And if you're a gospel believer at all, you are bound by Christian doctrine to believe that human life begins at conception. The Bible teaches that the unborn child is a person in the full sense. The other great truth you've got to grasp is this, and there it is on the sheet. The Bible proclaims and affirms that human life is the most precious thing in God's creation. It is sacred! Which is precisely what humanism doesn't believe, and the first two or three messages in this series were about humanism. Human life is sacred. There is nothing more wonderful. Genesis chapter 1 establishes that men and women and animals are not the same thing at all. God said, verse 26, 
Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Three times we're told that man is unique, made in the image of God. I haven't time to explain precisely what that means tonight. I've done that several times from this platform. But he is unique because he's made in the image of God. That's what makes him seek so, so different, so wonderful. He's the vice regent of God. He's there to rule creation. He is not an animal, nor related to them. And he didn't lose the image when he sinned. The image was defaced and spoiled. Look at Genesis 9. From the flood onwards, God says, I give you all these creatures to eat. That's why vegetarianism is nonsense and anti-Christian. But if you kill a fellow human, you have touched the image of God. You have touched sacred life. And therefore we get verse 8. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Animal life and human life are not in the same category. Isn't it incredible? That we have so much fuss about certain butterflies and whales. And much of it justifies why should whole beautiful species which God has made disappear? Why should they? We are custodians of the universe and we're, we are to look after this great gift which God's given us. But isn't it amazing that there's so much fuss about the loss of species, animals, plants, birds, and there is a slaughter of innocent boys and girls all around the world and nothing but nothing at all, it seems, is said. Abortion is a monstrous evil. Human life is unique. That's why the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Human life is unique. That's why he was in the form of God, and who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Human life is sacred life. Which is why Jesus Christ died for sinful humans. God commends his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Human life is sacred life. That's why when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within you. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, says Paul? Human life is sacred life, which is why there will be a resurrection of the dead, just and unjust. The human body is destined for eternity. Abortion is a monstrous evil. It is an attack upon the image of God and therefore an attack upon God himself. Please turn over the sheet. There are a few more things that we must say. There will be questions, of course, and we can take some of those on Wednesday. The problem is not round the, the few difficult questions. The problem is round the area of ignorance. Here are some things to think about. I just ask you to think about them. Why are they killing the unborn child? Has he done something wrong? Occasionally, and in 1994, it's almost unknown. Occasionally, a developing human life actually threatens and menaces the antecedent existing life of the mother. Abortion in that case would still be an evil, but it would not be a sin. But it's almost unknown in 1994. That is an academic question. Don't let that red herring ever take you off the biblical reality. But why are they killing the unborn child? Has he done anything wrong? They are killing him because they want to get rid of him. Here's something else to think about. If you develop the idea, and it's developed, 
that there is such a thing as a human life not worth living, you'll soon have infanticide, which is the killing of babies who are already born. In fact, we've already got that. And you'll soon have euthanasia, which is just a clever word for the killing of people who are inconvenient by and large. And we've already got that. Because it all comes from this idea that there is such a thing as a human life not worth living. And if you do nothing about the fate of the unborn or the defective newborn today, there is no reason in the world why your children tomorrow should not propose you as a candidate for euthanasia. The same logic. What's the point, says somebody? We'll never win. The point is the third thing to think about. We must always be willing to struggle for what is right, even when it is clear we're not going to come out on the top. It is wrong that unborn boys and girls should be killed in the womb. It is right to oppose it. We must do the right, if we have any Christian spirit at all, and oppose the wrong. Here are some things to do. These are suggestions. We can bind the human conscience with the word of God. But here are some suggestions. Pray. When you face the reality that there are 500 children in our nation alone killed by abortion every day, isn't it an amazing thing that our prayer meetings are not full? We are surrounded with such flagrant evil. Isn't it amazing that Christians are not motivated to take up the spiritual cudgels and to pray against it? The second thing you can do is educate. You know the arguments on both sides and do you know the facts? Have you educated your family? Have you taught your children about abortion? Are your children openly pro-child? Have you monitored the sex education that they get at school where abortion is often taught by implication with a certain smile and approval? Have you shown to your friends that to be pro-child is right, but it is also rational and compassionate? Do you keep an eye on what the media are saying? Do you know what they're saying? The third thing we can do is act. We're called to be salt and light as well as evangelists. Salt is there to stop the rot going any further. Light is there to show where, where the truth is and the right path is. And we're called to be salt and light, all of us. There is the myth of neutrality. We are being told today that abortion is scientific. Abortion is objective and abortion is reasonable. We're being told today that education is neutral. It's neither Christian nor anti-Christian. There is nothing neutral. There are no neutral ideas. They're either in captivity to Christ or they're not. Reject the myth of neutrality. There are elections coming up this year. Council elections, European elections. Why don't you get in contact with the candidates? Ask them questions. If you just tell them something, they probably won't reply. If you ask them a question, they probably will. Have you got an MP? He can't be educated on everything. He can't know about everything. He may never have even sat down and really thought through the abortion debate. Why don't you tell him? Giving him good reasons and solid evidence. And tell him you'll watch his voting record on pro-child issues. And make a fuss about the killing of boys and girls wherever you can make a fuss. And care. And here we come down to Christian basics. Ladies and gentlemen, even unmarried Christian girls sometimes get pregnant. Don't they? It's sad but true. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing in Belvedere Road Church? if a Christian girl had an unwanted pregnancy and she was so afraid of the censure and frowns and talking behind the hands and rejection that she would get that she would just go away somewhere on a long holiday and come back when her abortion was over. 
Wouldn't that be terrible? You know, it's possible not to condone her action and to love her still, to welcome her and to support her and to carry her through. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if a Christian community or Christian mother or father or both had on their hands the blood of some unborn child because of their rejecting attitude? Jesus was able to say, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. It is possible to speak against sin and yet be compassionate. And all along the pathway we meet people. There are unwanted pregnancies, there are handicapped children and there are elderly people who are infirm and there are people caring for them and looking after them. Do you have friends with a handicapped child? You've seen the strain and the grief and the worry, the expense of nervous and physical energy, the inability to do this, that and the other because of the enormous demands laid upon them by the child. They kept that child, didn't they? Countless other parents had theirs killed in the womb. Help them. Help them. Help the infirm, elderly and those who look after them. There are doctors amongst them, amongst us even. Contact them, find out what you can do. Join life, join the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child. Inform yourself, find out what else can be done. But live for Christ. In 1994, our calling is not political correctness. Our calling is to bear witness to the teaching of the Son of God. And that sometimes is a very heavy cross to bear. We'll sing the hymn 709.